Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Calco. I'm Chief Architect at Apex Data Solutions. The title of my talk today is It's Just Data, or Everything Your Database Can Do, Datomic Can Do Meta. It's, a, it's an ideas talk today, uh, so no code, but it's one that I hope will help you wrap your mind around the real value of Datomic's unconventional but incredibly powerful information model, and offer other tidbits from our experience in adopting it uh, that may be enlightening to you as well. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, deconstruct the title of this talk, It's Just Data, to introduce the underlying themes. And we'll talk about some of the uses and abuses of data generally that all of us have encountered in our life experiences, in particular our professional experiences. Uh, next, we'll meditate a bit on the topic I find really fascinating, which is whether and how far data models, um, as we currently build them, really model anything real. Uh, does fidelity to reality even matter, uh, or can we get by with less? Uh, we certainly seem to have been trying to get by with less for a long time, and I think Datomic teaches us that that's true. Or does domain description, asserting facts about our domain, hold out a better hope for an approach to traditional data modeling? How you think about a problem very often is the problem, and um, you know when we are modeling our domain, right, we, we really want to find the right description so that uh, the data that we store in our, in our databases is relevant and timely and available to us. Um, so I'd like to highlight how many of our data modeling wounds that we've all experienced are, in retrospect, self-inflicted. It's a natural outcome of the way that we've been taught to think about data. Our next topic um, will be we'll touch on Datomic's homo-iconic nature. The whole schema is data mantra. We can know intuitively that this is a profoundly important innovation. It's certainly the main one that caught my attention early on in our consideration of Datomic. But what does it mean practically for building real-world database systems? Finally, if there's still time, I'll talk briefly about the problem Apex is trying to tackle in the healthcare space, leveraging Datomic's process relational philosophy of data management. Uh, it's an easy problem. Uh, perhaps you've already solved it. I call it Pilot's Dilemma, or what is truth in a world of conflicting authorities about truth? And there's no place where that's more true in our experience than in healthcare. Okay, so our first task is to deconstruct or unpack the phrase, it's just data. Uh, bear with me. I hope that this will help us understand some important things about Datomic and why my company is investing in Datomic, uh, both technologically and philosophically, in order to solve some vexing puzzles in healthcare and other socially impactful industries, and why, just maybe, your company should too. So first, we're going to put emphasis on the word data. The first thing to note is that data is the plural form of datum, uh, which happens to be the fundamental unit of data storage in Datomic. In philosophy, it's any fact or set of facts assumed to be a matter of direct observation. In epistemology, the study of how we know what we know, it's often defined as the object of knowledge presented to the mind, presumably for ratiocination. In civil engineering, the word datum has an interesting meaning. It means any level surface, line, or point used as a reference in measuring elevations. A datum as a reference is an interesting idea if you think about it deeply. But the bottom line is, it's something in the real world that we care about something we want to think about, or maybe even something we want to do something about. Uh, or more radically, maybe it's something that we want to do something. And the good news is that Datomic is uniquely suited to diverse but practical ways of thinking about and getting the most out of our data. So now let's get some context around the word just. Just in this context is used as an adverb, modifying the object, which is data. Uh, the first adverbial meaning of just is only or merely, as in, Jane was just a rubius before she met closure. <laughs> Here, only or merely implies something presumably inferior. Uh, the good news for Jane is that she met closure. She became a closurist and transcended her previous state as a mere rubiist. Uh, but despite the happy ending, this sense of just implies a negative inference. The next adverbial meaning of just uh, is exactly or precisely, as in, that's just what I meant. Um, <laughs> where the, you know, where the 
thing that I meant and that, whatever the antecedent of that is, are exactly the same thing. They're one and the same. This is a neutral objective statement um, of equivalence. The last adverbial meaning of just I'll mention is actually really positively. It's meant to emphasize a positive feeling or emotion about a subject, as in, Portland weather is just glorious. Now, I'm from Tampa, Florida, so I'll just note parenthetically that this adverbial sense of just can be mm, a little less precise than the previous one and might indicate sarcasm. So what I'm getting at is, when we say it's just data, a listener who doesn't appreciate the object, which in our case is data, might take away from this expression that whatever it is, it's just data and therefore something inferior because data is inferior. Like it would be better if it wasn't just data. Um, but we love data, right? So we want to be able to say this in the precise or ideally even the positive sense. We want to say, yes, it's just data. And this precisely is what's so awesome about it. So OK, it's just data. And that's awesome. But what is the it we're talking about here precisely? Is it a good thing that makes us smile and laugh, or a scary thing from which we'd rather hide? I would contend that this depends on the database you're using. Because as you probably have guessed, the it I'm talking about today is schema. OK, so now we're firmly on topic. In Datomic, schema is just data. So what's schema then? One sense of the word is a plan, diagram, or scheme. Uh, when my wife and I moved into our house last year, uh, among other things we got, like the big HOA agreement, was the entire floor plan of the house in, in, in architecture form. Now, my wife was trained as a, a real architect. I'm uh, just a software architect. Uh, so I, I was kind of nervous about uh, a decision we were making related to the stove to replace it. We needed to know what kind of socket was behind it. And uh, since it didn't have a keyboard, I didn't know how to figure that out. But my wife was able to open up the plan, the schema, and go to you know, all the different keys and legends and discern that it was, it was a 220 outlet, not a 110, so we were cool. And that was a good thing to be able to look at the schema uh, in, in real time. And the next sense come from, comes from Kant's philosophy. And it sounds pretty harmless at first blush. A rule or principle that enables the understanding to apply its categories and unify experience. As if to make this clearer, he said, for example, universal succession is the schema of causality. I'm not going to try to explain that. Um, psychology provides a definition of schema as a mental model of aspects of the world or the self that is structured in such a way as to facilitate processes of cognition and perception. So it's basically Kant's definition, but with a experiential or a posteriori bias instead of an a priori bias. All we mean in data science is metadata about data. Schemas govern how our databases manage data, or not if we're foolish enough to buy into the crazy idea of schemalessness. Unfortunately, Kant's ideas uh, have corrupted everything, even data modeling. And I'm actually understating this. The issue is that too often we build models that confirm our bias about the world and thus collect data about it uh, and define it. You know, it gives us this godlike power to define the world and, and get data about it on our terms. And that, therein lies the danger, uh, which is a nice segue into my next topic. My next topic is how we use and abuse data for life. It's a play on the title of one of Nietzsche's smaller and lesser known rants entitled On the Use and Abuse of History for Life, where he talks about the then current obsession with historicism in uh, the pernicious ways hyper-consciousness of history, usually tainted by the bias of historians, poisons our view both of the past and, therefore, of the present. Now here I'm quoting John Dewey instead, who said a similar thing, but a bit more subtly and a bit more charitably. He said, time and memory are true artists. They remold reality nearer to the heart's desire. And that's really interesting to think about. Before I elaborate on that, let's take a step back and consider what are the good uses of data for life? Why, why do we need it? What do we do with it? Well, we want to make well-informed, fact-based decisions. Inasmuch as we collect data that provides good, actionable information, data can save our bacon. In the clinical space where we've been working, it can even save lives. Sometimes we have so much data that we need to crunch it based on models called simulations in order to comprehend how different events or variables affect outcomes. If, enough, if we have enough clean data, 
Uh, these can even have predictive value, and that's kind of the whole motive behind big data, right? Often we want to be warned when bad things are about to happen so that we can take preventative action. A medication reconciliation application that we built for the VA in a recent contract had this objective as its ulterior motive, if you will, for an elaborate metrics capture scheme that was intended at bottom to help the VA identify, among other things, at-risk veterans so that they could intervene proactively instead of read about more deaths in the news. So this is consequential stuff. Somewhat easier to explain use of data uh, these days is visualization. The quantity and complexity of data not so, is not something our minds grok natively, that is to say in raw data form. Uh, but if we can picture it, our minds can understand it faster than the most powerful silicon-based computer in the world. So this is a particularly useful and valuable um, use of data. Now the use of data we at Apex are particularly interested in is storytelling. Uh, this is another modality that the human mind grasps much more readily um, than raw data. <clears throat> and this is where Datomic's lose nothing philosophy of information management really shines. Sometimes it's more important to know how a patient's situation got to be this way than it is merely to know that it, what the situation is. I mean, in an emergency, yeah, we need to know what it is, and that's enough to kind of get started. But if you really want to bring healing, you've got to know the whole story. And good stories are what? They're about characters that evolve or change over time. Datomic is about identities whose state changes over time. Seems a good fit. We're also interested in filling gaps and correcting falsehoods in that story. And here again, Datomic's fact-based information model, combined with its closed world schema, provides a solid foundation for reasoning about the data that is known for that very purpose, to tell the patient's story and then to fill in those knowledge gaps. So now let's talk about the abuses of data for life. If our data is incomplete and we don't know or we don't care that it's so, we can make some really bad decisions, life-ending decisions. If our data is bad or corrupt or incomplete, our simulations can convince us or others that we're right when in fact we're wrong about something. Yeah, I don't think I need to comment on that one. Data can be used to obfuscate rather than clarify an issue. Is anybody old enough to remember the debate about smoking? <laughs> I happen to believe you should be allowed to smoke if you want to, preferably outside, but let's not pretend it's good for you from a cancer prevention point of view, right? Now the worst use of data, arguably, is to tell a deliberate lie, to modify or launder data to tell the story we want to tell and not the story that's true. Call it alternate facts or whatever, but this is really bad. So here's the problem in a nutshell. I'm going to read from uh, Charles Sanders' purse here. It will sometimes strike the scientific man that the philosophers have been less intent on finding out what the facts are than on inquiring what belief is most in harmony with their system. Charles Sanders' purse was a really important philosopher and a polymath, and his works as one of the founding fathers of semiotics, the study of signs, had a huge unsung impact in the 20th century. Wish I had more time to tell his story. But getting back to the matter at hand, I contend that modeling the world in SQL terms, in particular, holds no hope of avoiding this kind of dangerous systematizing. Datomic, however, allows us, if and only if we want to be, to be driven entirely by facts, i.e. data, even in the case of modeling our domain, uh, because it's just data. So let's talk about what that means with a really, really simple example. Um, no code, I promise, because I don't want the syntactic nuances of SQL and Eden to get in the way of the important concepts here. So in SQL, there's this concept of like not null, which is used as a kind of business validation that says, if we don't have this value associated with a given entity, reject the whole transaction for some new record we're creating. It's called required field, um, and we're, we're used to this in pretty much every database we've ever touched. Datomic doesn't have such a schema attribute to enforce the concept of required. For the same reason, it doesn't have a null value type. The granular nature of Datomic's information model expresses the non-presence of an attribute value in the simplest way possible. It simply isn't there. Attributes aren't grouped into some arbitrary tuple structure like in SQL, so it's actually quite easy to find that out. I mean, now let's consider a common example of this, right? Social security number. I worked on a financial planning practice management app uh, for so-called solo practitioners many, many moons ago. 
And in their requirements, the social security number was a required field for the client entity. Why was it required? Well, obviously, social security number is a required field on various client engagement and financial instrument application forms. Fair enough, you can't do business without it, uh, so it seems reasonable. More troubling, though, uh, social security was also part of the composite unique ID that was intended to be easy for the planner to remember. You know, think like Calc 9999, for example. So a number that should be kept entirely private in which you might not know when you meet somebody for the first time or second or third uh, was required just to add them to the database. That seemed to me a pretty bad idea. So my mind did what it usually did back when I was young and dumb and thought SQL was all the bomb. I started to decompose the client entity to arrive at an elegant ontology. I did this because I realized really quickly that key entities in the data model I was asked to create were in fact the same thing at bottom. Person, so a client, a relation, which is a relative of a client, used mainly for marketing purposes, but also for filling in beneficiaries and that kind of thing. Advisor, an employer could be a person, a solo practitioner could hire uh, a clerk or something to help them with data entry. So entities could be multiple things. Um, now it was a fascinating problem, but it got deeper. It got deeper. So person wasn't the only thing with a unique identifier from the IRS. Corporations, so sometimes a client will have a company and you need to do business planning with them. Um, and if you want to kind of protect their assets in the most radical way, you put it in an irrevocable trust because that has its own identity. Right? So all of these things and all of their subclasses, all of their descendants are essentially um, legal entities. <clears throat> Modeling this in SQL wasn't so hard, but querying to obtain all the data for a single legal entity with a tax ID that might be in the system was really quite painful. Uh, after a baker's dozen left outer joins, you start to see where this breaks down. Uh, for example, tax ID itself is called something different for each concrete entity subclass. Ugh, this isn't what I should be dealing with when I just want to save data. Before you know it, you're, you're recreating a problem that has since been called the impedance mismatch. And I did it with a vengeance on that project. It was, it was uh, very, very uh, fun on a certain intellectual level, uh, but in terms of getting the code written quickly and you know, deployed, it was actually very counterproductive. So then you, know, you start thinking, because this was all the rage back then, hey, I bet an ORM will help, an object relational mapper. Um, I have one piece of advice about that. Don't do it. Really painful. I spent so much time doting on the model and so little time really getting you know, productive user interfaces going. Um, it just didn't help. Right? I, was, I was fighting a problem with how the database thought I needed to store my data, and I was not fighting the problem with the domain, which was to help planners compete with the big guys, with their clients, you know, in some sort of uh, you know, technology-enabled way. So there is a better way. Let's ask the question, you know, what can and can't I do with and without the tax ID? Why not allow the system to store at least what I do know? And coincidentally, in healthcare, you know, um, some of the systems that have been built and worked for many, many decades were built way before there was SQL. And uh, one of them, with which we're very familiar, uh, Vista, runs on a language called MUMPS, uh, which is, uh, even sounds bad. Um, but it has a, an amazing storage capability built on something they call globals, which is like this n-dimensional sparse matrix. Um, and sparse matrix was, was a good thing because it meant you didn't have to fill in every blank and you weren't overly concerned about null, whether it was null or not. You just don't have any, you know, a patient's there at your doorstop bleeding. You don't have their social. What, you're not going to help them? Right? That wasn't feasible. So they, though, that area kind of evolved without all this nonsense for many years before. Uh, they started trying to pull everything into SQL. Um, so, okay, I, I need to have the Social Security by the time I sit down and engage somebody as a client to help them fill out financial application forms mainly, but it shouldn't mean that I can't keep information about them in the database at all for any purpose. Uh, so what's happened here? Like, how did we get to that place where that's even a problem? Well, we've let business logic complect the storage problem. Um, if you think about it, uh, wouldn't it be much simpler to let the business logic layer decide what to do in those cases? Well, this was at a time when that clean separation of layers was just kind of taking on, you know, just taking, taking on a life of its own. 
Uh, and the reason why you want to do that is it might change over time. And we all know that in SQL, for sure, schema change is pretty painful, or it can be. That was kind of the genius behind Rails, for example, which put validation in the application logic layer, which also isn't, by the way, the best place to put it, but data validation and business logic, this is kind of what I'm trying to get at here, they're easy to conflate in SQL-based systems because it's very tempting to use not null and stored procedures to provide a homogeneous set of rules for all client applications that might connect to your server. So again, this is very client-server mentality. But good architecture demands decoupling and layering anyway, and that's not hard anymore. There's lots of proven patterns out there, and we see them all the time in, in uh, big enterprises. So, you know, I would argue a well-designed end-tier system application, the application layer should also not worry about business and validation rules. It should get them from the business logic layer. Uh, and the good thing is you can still have uh, just one place to manage all that. So let's face reality here. Like, the deeper issue is that objects and entities in, fact ba in a fact-based world are total figments of our imagination. Um, they're not, they don't exist. They don't exist in the database, for sure. They're just sort of representations that help us maybe think about them. Um, and often we project into a domain in ways that subtly undermine the usefulness of our systems. It becomes less expressive with respect to reality as we become more deeply familiar with what that reality is in the domain. You know, when, when I first realized that a client actually wasn't a single person, it was usually a family was really the, the unit that you were dealing with because you had you know, beneficiaries and all that stuff going on. So a, a client could be a, a family, which is usually two people. In the past, it was just male and female. Now they could be both. And they may or may not be a second part of the family. It could be a single family home, right? You start getting, you start really thinking through what this means in the domain and, and how you apply this knowledge to, you know, uh, further the business purposes of the domain, and you realize if you didn't start out with that concept in SQL, it's a painful haul to change that, but not so in Datomic. You just add attributes as those facts about your domain emerge, and then you start adding data related to those facts, and it just grows organically. And you can always go back in time and query as of the schema that was enforced at that time that you're interested in, and that's, that's an amazing, mind-blowing kind of meta capability uh, the first time you experience it, um, you'll, you'll know what an aha moment it is. So, <clears throat> so what is an entity in Datomic then? In Datomic, <clears throat> data accretes in terms of attribute values as state associated with identities. And this is, a, this is the key point. What we call an entity in Datomic is really an identity. The entity value of a Datomic 5 tuple is just the ID of some thing in the database. And that thing could be many things in the domain. Um, the presence or non-presence of various attributes which we can give names, to which we can give names that imply entity characteristics for our mental convenience, that's what makes an identity an entity in Datomic. So how do I know I have a client here? Because when I ask Datomic in one call what, we know, what all we know about some identity, I get back all the attributes associated with it at that point in time. Some of these might be prefixed with client, right? Because that's what we, we gave attribute like client slash, you know, date of engagement, something like that. Um, and, and if not, then this identity is not yet a client. It's that simple. If it has some client attributes, but maybe social security is not one of them, well, they're a client. We've made some kind of verbal agreement. They want to work with you. Uh, but you're going to need to get that social security number before you help them buy a mutual fund. Right? So, I mean, that's the consequence of not having it, and, uh, and I can still have them in the database and know about them. So, you know, this doesn't have to be hard. Fault tolerance is a good thing in complex systems and databases involving complex domains where the very concepts of the entities are very tough to disentangle. Um, that's a good thing, and it is a complex system, just like any other. And no one layer in a distributed system solves all of our problems, right? We're really just trying to solve the storage problem with Datomic here, storing data. All right, if that all made sense, um, let me just switch gears and look at schema is data from a completely different angle. A year ago at the last Closure West, I heard a talk by Luke Vanderhart from Cognitech uh, about a new web framework called Arachne that he wanted to embark upon. Like many folks, uh, my first thought before I heard him speak was, oh, just what the world needs, another web framework. Arachne, Spider, Web, I get it. 
Um, but almost as soon as he opened his mouth and began to articulate his vision, I realized he was really talking about something different, um, something new. And um, the web framework pitch for Arachne was really kind of the sizzle to sell a much more radical and, to my mind, interesting stake. I was at that time ruminating on how to take the work we were doing for the VA on a generative programming framework called Vista Services Assembler to the proverbial next level. Uh, in this context, as I heard Luke describe his vision for a totally data-driven framework that used Datomic in-memory database to actuate real instances of applications, I found myself unconsciously nodding. You know, many years ago, I want to say around 2003, someone gave me uh, this book for my birthday, and, it, and I read it with great interest because it was about generative programming. That's always been an itch I wanted to scratch. It's called Generative Programming Methods, Tools, and Applications, and its vision of totally component-based automated application assembly really appealed to me. Uh, book's a bit dated today. Um, most of the examples are in C++ and a few in Smalltalk. But nevertheless, I always wanted to see the software industry get beyond the hard coding or even code generating to a more reliable way to produ produce diverse applications quickly. To make a long story short, we've invested in Luke's efforts on Arachne, and it's close to being usable today. In fact, we have been building much of our stack, which we call Apex Unify, on Arachne, or at least its core principles. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone to check out where it's at today. Just go to www.arachne-framework.org and try out the tutorials. So Arachne still has some really rough edges, but as Luke will almost too defensively protest, but it really pushes the boundary of this schema as data concept. I recently had an epiphany about it myself, <laughs> One of those moments when something you know intuitively um, just sort of crystallizes, and suddenly you're actually able to explain it to somebody else. Uh, so I ran it by Luke, and the logic goes something like this. If some data is code, and we know this because in Lisps like Clojure, all code is data, and if all schema is data, as is the case in Datomic, then it follows that some schema is, or at least can be, code, by which we mean use like any other data to generate behavior at runtime. You know, as with Lisp, you have to posit some runtime to make these assertions operational. For datomic schema is data, there's the datomic runtime. In the case of schema as code, that's what the Arachne runtime gives you. It's a deeply meta concept and that I find, frankly, really exciting. Now, in its current form, that schema is, in fact, indistinguishable from code in that you configure your Arachne system with component-provided domain-specific languages, or DSLs. So if you're a component developer, you follow a few simple rules to, you know, basically Stuart Sierra component and have a, a, a parameterless constructor. And then somewhere you could define a DSL to describe to the using system how to configure this component. Um, and... Um, you know, when you think about it, that's, that's pretty cool. Now, if he's been panned a little bit for this, um, using a DSL as the first way to do it, but if you think config and DSL is retro, you're right, but you're missing the point. It's just a bootstrapping convenience for Arachne in its early form. The future is a configuration that can be obtained directly from a persistent database. Arachne could connect to the database instance you tell it to go to, find the configuration specification you want, and then it does its magic pulling down all the required components and assembling them together dynamically right then and there. How much easier it will be to mix and match components in a completely declarative and maybe even drag and drop way. Um, you know, um, and we're not just talking about web applications here, any kind of application you can conceive. He's working right now on something he calls Chimera, which is a data abstraction layer for Arachne that will unfetter your domain from tight coupling to any one kind of storage. And you think about it, that's sort of the next step of what Datomic's doing. It's, it's decoupling the peers who want to query data from the concrete storage. Well, if that's good enough for peers that need to execute queries, why isn't that good enough for your domain? And that's sort of where he's going with it, and it's kind of cool. It means that I have the convenience to choose whatever backend makes sense uh, for that domain. And in this context, we're talking about more transactional systems, maybe not necessarily a Datomic instance, which um, which, of course, Chimera also supports. So anyway, just something, things to think about. That's, that's probably one of the more um, interesting, um, um, for me anyway, uh, directions that this whole schema as data, as code is going. Okay, how much time we got here? Okay, 10 minutes. <laughs>
All right, so now that we got this far, a few quick words about problems that we at Apex, we at Apex are tackling with Clojure, Datomic, and Arachne. Our recent experience on a big contract with the VA to implement a full stack data federation platform, and in particular to federate data across its 150 plus instances of Vista, that's its EHR, uh, electronic health record, has really helped us refine a vision for a new full stack platform which we call Apex Unify. Key to Apex Unify is a new information management capability that we're building on top of Datomic uh, for long term storage. Uh, we're using Arachne's design principles and in some cases early versions of the code. Um, and this, this new information management capability we call Apex Forever DB uh, for use in highly regulated industries like healthcare and finance. Forever DB is addressing a really hard problem that isn't going to get any easier as the industry finally begins to work toward the elusive goal of real data interoperability. I don't have enough time to get into the details, but suffice to say that we're taking a very pragmatic approach to a problem the industry really hasn't grappled with yet. The problem is what I call pilot's dilemma. In a word, what is truth? Specifically, what is truth in a world of conflicting authorities of truth? And um, the reality with which people haven't really quite grappled yet is that in the quest for data interoperability between disparate electronic health records, <clears throat> what we consider a source of truth in the form of any one EHR instance is in fact just the source of belief about truth. Uh, it's like the old song, you know, two men say they're Jesus, one of them must be wrong. Well, they both can be wrong, and with EHRs, it's tragically all too often the case. Local VA informaticists right here in Portland, uh, one, of our, one of our best sponsors on this project, did a study to discover what percentage of the time a veteran walked in the door and the med list was incorrect. Shockingly, it was 100% of the time. And that's pretty staggering when you think about it, and they actually computed based on you know, the sheer number of encounters that there are that that's 3,500 veterans that have adverse reactions ranging from you know, morbidity to mortality. And when you run the numbers, that's amazing. It's like horrible. For many years, the industry has been obsessed with semantic interoperability because they recognize EHRs could be built on different concepts. They may be dealing with some of the same kinds of data, but they have different concepts. A real good example there is uh, RPMS and Vista, which are both written in mumps on a DBMS called FileMan. But they're very different. Uh, RPMS is based on the visit, that's the core semantic abstraction. And the VA's Vista is based on departments, which in the VA are legion. You know, so they, it's all broken down by departments. Now, even within Vista, I would contend there's some, some difference, but that's a little bit more negligible. Now, <clears throat> The problem nobody's really looking at, even in the case, even in the case where, as with the VA, uh, there aren't many semantic differences of a show-stopping significance, um, there's a, the problem is data reconciliation. And this is as much about identity and access management as it is about workflow or discrepancy resolution. It's a big ball of problems when you've got to say, this VA think, this instance thinks that, and this one thinks this, and I'm a doctor right here with the patient, uh, what's true? Well, um, our object should be to create new tools, techniques, and user experiences for workers at the point of care. Obsessing about systems, quote unquote, talking to each other, which is the kind of the common way they talk about it, um, I think is distracting nonsense. What matters is, is getting what is known in the hands of the provider in the most relevant way for each and every encounter. So we need to empower not enslave providers at the point of service with a radically different user experience, one that allows them to solve these hard problems and makes all the back-end data complexity just something they don't have to think about at all. Right. So to summarize, it's just data is a joyous fact about schema in Datomic. And when you grok it, you will love it. Datomic's information model gives the real world a voice in our system designs if we're careful to listen to it rather than simply projecting our illusions on it. SQL entities are to data what objects are to state, a hot mess. Um, avoid them if you can. Think in terms of identities with state that we can track over time instead. Your application developers will love you, and so will your customers. Schema is data means that schema can also be code. We may be on the verge of a new era of generative programming, and Arachne might be part of that. Check it out. Finally. Truth is hard to know, let's not make it harder. <laughs>
Uh, and if these are problems you'd like to help us solve, please visit our table or catch me later. We're hiring.